Yeah, Obama claimed he was going to get rid of the lobbyists. I, he has not done so, is the simple answer to your question. And I, I just want to share a personal lobbyist story so you know who the real power is in this country. The real power in this country, aside from the shadowy figures with this Council on Foreign Relations, who are very real, but the people influencing your state legislature, they're lobbyists. I'll tell you how I know this. I had a anyway, I'm, I'm in Concord, and I'm trying to get them to pass one simple law, and I'd love to see it passed here in Montana. It's a law that says if they put an RFID tag in something, and then sell it to you, give it to you, issue it to you, they have to tell you it's there. This stuff can be hidden into the soles of shoes. It can be sewn into the seams of your clothes. You'll never know it's there if they don't want to tell you. And we wanted a law that simply said, if you put it in my shoe, label it, plain and simple. No brainer. All right. So I've been up there lobbying as an unpaid citizen lobbyist for weeks. And I'm sitting in the office of the most powerful senator in the state senate. And we're sitting probably this far apart. He's right there. I'm sitting right here. And he said, you know, Catherine, you're absolutely right. I totally believe that this stuff is dangerous and we need to pass your bill. But I don't think we can do it. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? You're telling me it should pass and you're telling me you're not going to pass it. Why? He, and he leans forward and he says, well, let me tell you how things work around here. <laughs> he says, um, if you want to get a bill passed, you need FaceTime. And I'm looking at him, I'm looking at his face, it's not four feet from my face, and I'm saying, well, what is this? I made an appointment, I'm in your office, but is this not FaceTime? He says, no, Catherine, you get FaceTime at the fundraisers. And I went, okay, stupid me, I'll go to the darn fundraiser then. So I find out there's a fundraiser that afternoon for another senator. I, I get to the building, it's this lovely wood-paneled restaurant across the street, and I say, I'll get some FaceTime with the senator at his fundraiser. I get to the door, $500 to walk in. You have to write a check to get in the room. And I didn't have 500 bucks, and I stood outside, and I'll never forget, it was a very cold spring morning in New Hampshire, and I stood outside shivering, watching through the window while that senator backslapped and had drinks and was drinking cognac and whiskey with the very same lobbyists who were opposing my bill. And guess who won at the end of the day? They did. So that's how it works. Our Social Security recipients part of a captive group. I'll say anybody who has anything to do with the government in any way, shape, or form for their livelihood is going to be one of the first captives because they know that you don't have any choice. So absolutely, Social Security recipients, uh, food stamp recipients, welfare recipients, people who receive uh, uh, housing assistance, Medicare, Medicaid, all of that is going to be one of the first ones to come under the umbrella uh, of these systems. All right, we have time for just one more question, if anybody has one. Yes, ma'am. Question is, um, you had a GPS, or she had a GPS uh, census worker come to GPS her home and would not allow it to be done. Did that put you on a special list? You know, I don't know. I would have done the same thing. I never saw the GPS worker. I have a chain across my driveway and a big no trespassing sign, and I kept waiting for them to try to get in so I could I could just stand my ground and say, you, you go home. <laughs> I, they never showed up. So um, do they have a special list? They probably have a list of non-compliance, but it's probably not so they can single you out as a troublemaker. It's probably just so they can send somebody else out to do it later. You know, but I don't know. I don't have any evidence either way. It's, um, she's a nurse, and a couple weeks ago they had a drug company come in that the government would be distributing this wine for vaccine. There's, there's, a, there's a good chance that that is true. I actually believe that to be true. Did I mention to you guys that my husband was in the emergency room after getting a bad vaccine? I'm not a fan of these things. I, I don't like them. Uh, I'm not going to let the government stick a needle in my arm just like I'm not going to let the government rape me. I mean, there are certain things. It's bodily integrity. It's your body. They don't have a right to do anything to your body. So I'm going to oppose that to the end. Absolutely. Um, why is the government going to be issuing the vaccine? I believe, and, and again, this is my trying to make sense of the data that I'm seeing, I'm actually concerned that they may know something we don't know about this particular flu virus. Because what we've seen so far is not virulent enough to justify a vaccination, a mass vaccination. Um, when you actually read, there's a number of really excellent books, I'd be glad to turn you on to them and let you know what they are. When you read books about upcoming pandemics and flu uh, by experts and journalists and other people who wrote this long before this particular flu came around, you'll see that there is a very, I believe, a very real concern that we could live through another thing like the Black Plague, where you have 70% of people dying. If that happens, then populations will be panicked. I mean, if you see people, corpses rotting in the street, people dying all around you, people are going to become violent and demand the vaccine. I, I, I read that in a newspaper, and I thought, that's crazy. And I thought about it, and I thought, no, that's exactly what would happen if you 
got into that situation where people were raped and dying. And in that case, it probably would be the government that would be issuing it. Um, should it be mandatory? No way. I mean, that's all I can say. We've got a bill, um, speaking of bills that you can help us pass in Montana, we've got a bill called the Bodily Integrity Act, which is against forced microchipping. And it's very, very similar. In fact, you could probably use some of the language in it against micro, uh, against vaccination. Um, bodily integrity, meaning it's the integrity of my body, you can't violate it. It's a one-page PDF. You can find it on our uh, chipping website at antichips.com. You can print it out and get it to your state legislators, and they'll probably introduce it. Very simple. It just says you can't microchip somebody against their will. Uh, you can't treat people differently depending on whether they have it or not. You can't fire people or refuse them government benefits or whatever if you don't have the chip. Plain and simple. Very, very, very straightforward bill. Plain, simple English. Anybody can understand it. And if you want help getting it, I'll get a copy to you to get to your legislators. But you could use that as a model. I mean, I'm, I've, I, I probably have confused people because on the one hand I oppose the vaccine, but on the other hand I'm not buying into all of the fear mongering about why it was developed. So, and vaccines do. I mean, they kill people. No question, but they don't kill 80% of people on purpose. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to be, like I said, I'm here the rest of the evening tonight. Look forward to socializing with some of you. Many of you I know uh, as callers to my radio show, and I would love to attach a face to the voice. And I want to thank you for all your wonderful Montana hospitality. It's been an absolute pleasure being here, and I'll be happy to sign copies of books for you. And thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. All right. Okay. And she is so right. 